Yasmin here with Rima, Bilal, and Ali. Hey guys. <laughs> so today we're talking with the background of the flooding in Dearborn that really shook up the city. And I think why we're having this conversation is because it really exposed the mistrust that we have for local government. And that's the conversation that we're having today and the reason why we have two policy and government experts or they probably won't be happy with me calling them experts they are um <laughs> they definitely are and they wrote an article kind of detailing what happened and why it happened and so i ask you both what made you write the article so, so the flood that happened a couple of weeks ago can best be characterized as um, the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, after emerging from a once-in-a-century pandemic, after experiencing the largest social protest movement in U.S. history last summer, after experiencing a national election unlike any other, Dearborn residents were finally given some glimmer of hope um, with, the, with the vaccine to like re-enter life, social order, re-emerge and come out of this uh, perhaps stronger than ever. And, and what they found themselves instead is submerged in waste high water in their basements. And so because of that, we felt like the anger that we felt from Dearborn residents, Bilal and I both grew up in East Dearborn, um, was palpable. And so we immediately got on the phone together and we started saying, hey, you know, w let's, 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 let's see how we can utilize our talents. And Bilal and I like to think of ourselves as storytellers and so we immediately emerged uh, and engaged in a journalistic story where we wanted uh, to write a piece that mirrored the anger that we felt from Dearborn residents um, and we hope we did that with this piece. Absolutely, I, I would just quickly add, I mean, this was unprecedented anger. I mean, between us, we've probably lived in Dearborn for 50 years combined. Uh, I've personally never seen anger like this and also there seemed to be like uh, a different sort of tenor between what the government was saying and what people were saying. And so on the government side, there seemed to be a lot of talk about engineering, about elevation, about mm -hmm. topography, about water levels. And when you spoke to people, which is why I wanted to speak to more people, um, a lot of the comments were about, this is just one, this is just another insult in a long line of insults. Wow. Um, and so we, we wanted to, I, I think the work of journalism certainly, is to clarify and to humanize. We wanted to clarify what the stakes were for so many people, and we wanted to humanize uh, their experience. Yeah, so that's actually a really good point, and I, I know that you all are storytellers, and I love that that's what you centered in the piece. You talked to so many people from all around the city, from different backgrounds, um, and I'd just love to hear from each of you a couple of the stories that stuck out the most uh, and why. I mean, we, Bilal and I spoke on the phone and I think we both had the same question for the other person, which is like, why do you want to do this? Um, and then we just got in the car and we said, well, we want to center the stories of those closest to the pain. And so what we did is we got in the car and drove over to the South End. Um, because at that time, this was about a week and a half, uh, two weeks ago now, um, all the stories that came out, whether they were in local papers and regional papers, they, they were quoting the same people. And so Bilal and I got in the car, we drove over to the South End, the South End, which is majority comprised of Yemenis, um, and you know, have thriving businesses, thriving hospitality. Um, you know, this, this part of Dearborn that's tucked between factory stacks in the city of Detroit. And, and we started, we got, out, we got out of our car, knocked on doors and started talking to people. Um, the story that gripped me the most, uh, quite honestly, didn't make it into our piece because we didn't feel like we had um, the agency to tell the story, but it was of an elderly man who died uh, in his basement, someone who faced mobility challenges. Um, and it was actually a friend that one of my friends uh, called me and told me about the day after the floods where he was found face down, drowned in sewage water in his basement. Um, presumably got stuck, presumably the water came in, couldn't get out. I mean, it, it's, it's haunting to even think about. Um, but someone died. Someone died as a result of city negligence. Someone died as a result of the city government's failures. Um, and people will be facing health consequences too for the long run. I mean, when you have waste high water in your basement, there's mold spores, there's a lot of different health outcomes that can happen. And so the fact that one person died is the story that haunts me the most. Um, and there are so many other stories that we tried to capture in the piece. I'm sure Bilal has one to tell. Uh, we drove to the south end, to the east end to tell those stories. 
Absolutely. I mean, one of the stories that did make it into the piece was that of uh, Selwa Jawad, who lives on Oakman Boulevard. And I think what was particularly haunting about speaking with her is how just instinctively and reflexively she was able to, like, you know, place this moment, this flood in history. You know, she, she worked um, in, in, uh, in an East End school cafeteria for a long time. Um, and she just, like, was able to, you know, like, crisscross through all these different issues from sewage backups to electricity to, you know, the East End parks that are not maintained to pools that are not maintained to the privatization of the ca cafeterias. And I think on my part, initially, there was, like, this tendency to, to bring her back on track. Like, let's talk about the floods. But then I realized, like, these things are about the flood. Yeah. Because when you don't trust government because of history and because of inequality, and, and by the way, one big lesson uh, from this is people are experts. P the people are the experts yeah. when it comes to what's happening in their neighborhoods. Yeah. And so when you're talking to someone like Salwa Jawad, and she's able to just recite this laundry list of, of uh, slights uh, from the city, uh, it was unforgettable, truly. Community building 101 is you listen to the community and you listen to the people and where do you both think the disconnect is between the city government and the people? Because like you said, people know what they need and know what they want. Right. I mean, I think the disconnect is in representation. You know, in Dearborn we have a city council. It's a seven member city council. And six out of the seven members of the city council do not live in the east end or the south, the south end or the southeastern part of Dearborn, um, known as the south end. The city council's job is to represent. It's actually not to oversee like the, the engineering and, and to administer the nuts and bolts of uh, infrastructure. And so I think there's a bare bones failure to represent um, people's grievances in those neighborhoods. Yeah, and, and, and I take a grimmer look at this, to be honest with you. I, th I think what we're seeing is sort of the misinterpretation of what public service is in Dearborn. Um, and, I, and, and, and I worry about the consequences for the future, because if you have the younger generation looking up to their representatives and thinking, well, this is what public service is, it's, it's not. Public service is exactly as you say, Yasmin. It's, it, it's representing the people closest to the pain. It's making sure that their voices are heard at the city council level. Now, when you have structural issues such that the South End and the East End have, what, less than 5 10 percent representation in the city council. Very little city workers live on the east and south end. The majority of them live on the west end, mm -hmm. which is something we heard from a lot of people, by the way. They, they reminded us often, by the way, Ali, by the way, Bilal, the majority of the city workers, where do they live? The majority of the city government, where do they live? They reminded us of this. We weren't bringing it up to them. And so what, 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 I, what I see is a fundamental failure at public service at recognizing that your job as city representatives, as a city government, is to make sure that you speak as a loudspeaker, as an amplification, not for the voiceless, for those who have been systematically excluded. And in Dearborn, those who have been systematically excluded, those who have, have been pushed to the margins, are people that live on the east side and the south end. Um, and that's the kind of storytelling that we wanted to do with this piece. Can you explain like more in depth like systematic exclusion and kind of like what that looks like in a city like what it looks like is your interests and your life experiences not having a platform to be told. Mm -hmm. And so when, when, when you grow up a certain way, that's your life experience. I mean, y y you can't help it. If you grow up poor and working class, then you're molded by that experience. If you grow up black in America, you're molded by that experience. If you grow up in the, uh, as an Arab or Muslim identifying person, especially in the post 9-11 era, you're molded by that. And so systematically being excluded from representation means that people that have fundamentally different life experiences are those who are speaking on your behalf. Now, there are ways to rectify rectify this gap between your representatives and those who they're supposed to represent. Namely, it's by listening to those people often and as necessary as possible. Um, this flood showed us that city government, Dearborn city government, does not listen to people on the east side, does not listen to people on the south end. We interviewed community activists from the south end. They have been complaining, they said, for decades, yeah. for decades, about issues that they're experiencing, uniquely experiencing in the south end, and the city government has done nothing about. And so this is a moment to recognize 
recognize that that anger is justified, mm -hmm. to recognize that there are remedies that have to be put into place, and that this has to be a breaking moment for Dearborn and for people to recognize that something has to be done moving forward. Yeah, I actually want to keep on this topic of just local politics. I was telling Yasmin about this interaction I had very recently leading up to this episode where uh, I was sitting at a local coffee shop, just you know, minding my business, doing my work, and a, a person running for local office approached me just asking about, Dearborn Girl, what's up, what's new? Uh, and when I mentioned that we would be talking, I didn't even say anything. All I said is we are covering the floods. And the person urged me to stay apolitical. Hmm. Meanwhile, wearing like a political campaign t-shirt, right? So I remember like as soon as this person walked away, I had this like epiphany of for the longest time, my entire life living in this city, people, the politicians are apolitical. And I just feel like that's kind of speaking to what you're saying is, is people need you to take a stand because these issues inherently are political. We've let them get to that point. What are your thoughts on this like apolitical politician vibe that we have going on in the city? You know, I, I would say first and foremost, if your existence is political, it's hard to be apolitical. If you grow, Can you explain that? That's if, if you, if you um, grow up in a place, for example, like the South End, um, where you go to school and, and, and after playing on the playground, you could literally wipe the industrial suit off your clothes. Um, that is a fundamentally political experience. Yeah. That's not happenstance. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes to uh, live in uh, polluted air and carry an inhaler everywhere they go and yeah. their stories of birth defects. Of, th there's all kinds of problems. And so people who experience those things don't have the luxury of saying, ah, well, you know, this person's my friend. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to sort of alienate that relationship. Rock right, or rock the boat, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, it's funny uh, on this question of politics. One other very common theme that we notice, especially in the South End, is people consistently say that the only time they hear from their government is when people are running for office. Mm -hmm. uh, one, uh, uh, one particular person, uh, Ziad, uh, who's a candidate for city council, he had a very poignant quote, which he said, um, they treat us like a political farm, and they only come when our votes are ripe for the picking. Wow. Um, so, you know, th th that's political. You know, th that's pretty political. Yeah. You know, the way that I approach my, the world really, but especially my work in public health, is that your life outcomes are dictated by being born in a certain time, in a certain place, in a particular skin, and under particular social and economic circumstances. And I, and I juxtapose that all the time with the 400 trillion to one accident of my birth, of your birth, of your birth, and your birth. And that, that, that grounds me. That grounds me in the knowledge that almost everything that happens to us is by chance. Mm -hmm. Yes, granted, you've accomplished some things because of your effort, but you've also been the beneficiary of a lot of luck, just like you have, just like I have. And I think the root of that is that good things don't happen to you because you work hard all the time. Some, you're the beneficiary of luck. Yeah. And similarly, people who aren't on, who, 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 who don't benefit or who face worse outcomes, it's not because of decisions they made. They've had some bad luck. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps ground me. And so when I think about the fortuitous fortuitous nature of our lives and how so much of it is by accident. Where you live, your zip code is a better indicator of your health outcomes, for example, than your genetic code. It, it, it grounds me in this reality that people that live on the east side and the south end, they didn't do anything to deserve that. Right. And people that live on the west end who are benefiting from better social services, from uh, lack of flooding, from the lack of health outcomes that people on the East and South End are going to suffer. They didn't necessarily do, they don't necessarily earn that either. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I've heard people say to me, you know, Ali, like, uh, that's just the way the world is. If you pay more on your taxes, uh, you're going to get treated. Like, no, like, no, that's not how you treat people. And it's government's function to assure the conditions for everybody to lead dignified and healthy lives. And in Dearborn, there's a failure of that. There's a monumental failure. People are still struggling. People are still crying on the east and the south end. Meanwhile, you have city government and certain officials um, crying about being held accountable. If real pain is on the east side and the south end, it's not what's happening on the west end or in the city government. And really, that's what we wanted to do with this piece, is make sure that it was a mirror reflecting the anger that we felt was palpable and unprecedented from folks in Dearborn. Mm -hmm. That was powerful. That was. 
what as a community can we do moving forward? How can we start to ask? I have one quick question before okay. this. Just because you brought up something and I know if I can imagine like certain people listening will feel like they're being left out of this conversation because they m might happen to live on the West End and their house got flooded too. And I know you got DMs, I got DMs, she got mm -hmm. DMs. We all got DMs of people uh, trying to minimize the argument that you're making by illustrating and telling their real stories of their house getting flooded too. How can we contextualize them in this conversation of inequity, given that their house got flooded too? By calling them in and asking them to be concerned about the people closest to the pain like we are. Uh, because quite frankly, this isn't about you. And attempts by those who probably suffered, by the way, on a, a smaller level, it, this isn't about you. I mean, I. And if you suffered, it is like you should be mad. Right. right? I mean, suffering is absolute. It's not relative. Like right. if if you suffered, you you suffered, and I and I sympathize with you. But this is about the aggregate. This is about models. This is about populations. And as a public health person, I'm concerned with populations. I think we all are. That's what justice is about: is looking at people who have been pushed to the margins. And so, to those who you know who have suffered in their own way. Um, you know, I, I, I sympathize, but quite frankly, uh, it's not about you. And if you're angry that we're highlighting the stories of people closest to the pain, um, I've got some bad news for you because you're going to get a lot angrier because the kind of world that we're trying to create is going to piss you off a hell of a lot more because true justice means people with power, any kind of power, define that as you will, it requires you to lose some of that power. That's what justice looks for. And as people who are concerned with justice, that's what we plan on doing. So powerful. Um, then what do we do moving forward? Well, I mean, I, I think like this is truly an inflection point in the history of the city of Dearborn. Um, I think for the longest time, particularly when it comes to Arab Americans' relationship with the city of Dearborn government, it's been a hush-hush type of relationship. You know, when one of the longest serving mayors in our history, uh, Michael Guido, literally rescued his campaign by, by calling the, the city's Arab residents a problem in a 12-page pamphlet that he sent to 90,000 people. He was polling in third, and the, the, the cheap shot of calling Arabs a problem rescued his campaign. We embraced Michael Guido. Arab Americans embraced Mayor Guido. I think what's, what's different now in terms of how do we move forward is the hush-hush approach has run its course. The, 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 the cat is out of the bag. Everybody knows uh, what's going on. Hopefully city officials, uh, despite their relative distance from some of these neighborhoods who were most impacted, hopefully they understand too um, that people know exactly what's going on. There actually isn't much of a disconnect. It's not hard for your average resident to connect what happened in their basement to what's happening in City Hall. We tend to think that that sort of analysis is the stuff of, you know, government expertise. It's really not. It's, it's really quite simple because, again, going back to what um, we were talking about earlier, people are experts when it comes to their own lives and circumstances. The street in front of their home, the tree in front of their home that's getting ripped out for a sewage project, they know exactly what's happening. And so uh, the status quo is simply untenable and it can't continue anymore. Yeah. You know, and, and, and Bilal references something really important, which, you know, the, the Michael Guido story. It, it shows us that our history is merely prologue. And America is, is really, really bad at reconciling with our history. I mean, you see this especially with the ongoing racial justice conversations um, and, and, and the call for reparations. You know, similarly, the story of Dearborn through the flood, through the lens of the flood, is really the story of America. It's really the story of every small town city in America. And, 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 and to be more specific, it's the story of who bears the brunt of environmental injustice. Because I hate to break it to people, but the climate emergency is not this future abstract thing. It's here and it's now. And the climate emergency assures us that there will be more flooding, that there will be more extreme weather patterns, and that people will be flooded again in Dearborn and elsewhere across the country. And so what we need to do is really highlight those stories of the people closest to the pain who are just systematically excluded from everything, man. Just, just everything. From, from, from news outlets, from uh, town halls. I mean, there's a reason why they don't hold town halls in the South End. It's because the air is so caustic. Bilal and I were driving in, and it, you guys have probably driven in too. You have these battered roads where you have to start playing, you know, go-kart to try to avoid them. Uh, you have this caustic air. You have these indus industrial stacks spewing just toxicity. And I first thing I said to Bilal uh, is, dude, like, that's Salina? Salina's right there, and, like, the toxic pumes are right yeah. there? And so what 
what we need to do is listen to the people. And one thing that people in the South End are asking for is ward representation. So that, w w which, which means that the South End and the East End and other parts of Dearborn, they'll have representation in city council. Because as Bilal mentioned, six out of seven don't live in the East or South End. So that's one potential solution. But really what we're here, what we try to do with this piece is mirror the anger and then also try to uh, uh, have people's stories be told. And that's one thing that people told us they want. So the explanation of the ward system is essentially you'd have representation based on location. Oh, and yeah. so do you, well, either any of you know why we don't have that right now? It's, it's part of the, as far as I understand, it's part of the city charter. The, the city mm -hmm. charter basically outlines how the government uh, of Dearborn will be organized, how it will work. And by the way, um, that's on the ballot this August, uh, whether or not to amend the charter. Mm -hmm. So that's something that people should pay attention to. So then how do people vote on that? Well, I think initially you have to vote to amend the charter. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so you're not voting on specific changes, but you're voting on whether or not to change it, period. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Something that I've been reflecting on just through this conversation is this idea of serving and the fact that in so many ways you guys in writing this article were representing people better than our leaders were and more importantly from there uh, just the idea that like we're not used to that. I don't know how it looks. Yeah. I know how it looks theoretically but I have never in my 28 years of living right by Forts in high school have known how it looks to have a local official obviously a national national official either, but if we're focusing on local politics, it should be easier for someone to come have coffee on my front porch and get to know my neighbors and understand what it is that we need. I've never seen that. And I think it goes back to your point of like, yeah, we're not ripe for, like unless they need our vote and they're knocking right. on our door, but what could that look like? Can you help like people listening envision a world where we have local officials who actually serve us and represent us? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that, frankly, hopefully uh, Ali does, but I will say this. I think when you listen to certain government officials in this city, it's almost as if they're asking for the reverse, as if citizens need to... Leave them alone. No, 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 that citizens need to uh, go to their doorstep and, and sort of, you know... Uh, yeah, and, and, and no, like, like we don't have, um, you know, we don't have a sort of monarchy in the city where you go to the throne. You have to be enmeshed in the communities that you're serving. If you don't live there, that's one thing. It would certainly help if you lived in the communities and sent your children to the same schools that people in the South End are going to, like Salina. But short of that, you know, it's good to stop by every so often in a non-election year. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is about what government owes its people, you know, and, and, and um, there's this wonderful senator from Massachusetts, he used this line last summer at Markey, he said, you know, uh, t t he sort of put back John F, uh, John F. Kennedy's quote about like, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, and Ed Markey flipped that and said, quite frankly, I think it's time to start asking what government can do for its people versus people doing for its government or its country. And like, I, I, I agree with that. And what we're seeing in Dearborn is I think just this natural caustic effect of, of, of what politics is supposed to be about. And, and if you're running for office, you know, Mimi, your question fundamentally is asking for imagination. Yeah. And, and, and politics is about imagination. Yeah. And if you're running for office, what what are you what are you doing? Why are you running to maintain the status quo? Which is what a lot of people, quite frankly, do that I see in Dearborn, a lot of other local municipalities, and I think they 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 lack in offering an imagination about what can be possible if government serving its people. And quite frankly, Bilal knows this. I I am worried about the next generation of you know, young people who have grown up in this context of public service being celebrity. And it's not, it's not that. Public service is in the background. It's what you're doing when no one knows you're doing it. And, you know, I, I work for an animal of an organization, the largest infrastructure in, in world history, the U.S. federal government. And no one knows anybody else, but you know that people are doing the quiet work necessary. And honestly, it's so grounding to be a part of an enterprise that has 2.2 million people. And so I, I do have concerns about what the future of public service looks like in Dearborn. Um, I've seen it already in younger people talking about their own celebrity. And I think that if you're running for office, then not only are you opening the doors to accountability, but it's on its citizens, like us four here, to hold, that, to hold those public officials accountable. Yeah, can we talk about accountability yes. really quick. Are we good? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what does that look like? And like, besides going and making noise at city council meetings, what can people do? And how do you hold your, like, the question I wanted to kind of go through is like, 
like why are people afraid of being held accountable why are there so many like defensive reactions to people asking you to listen to them and like understand their pain i'm sure bilal has a lot on this i'll, I'll just offer a quick thought um which is um, you know, the defensiveness, the insecurity, the projection, um, that's for city officials to grapple with in their own therapy time. Uh, quite frankly, people's lives are at stake and people's livelihoods are at stake. And so when people, public officials come out uh, with statements around, you know, being w w what they perceive to be sort of this bullying, and of course, if there's actual bullying, that's another story, but when you're being held accountable, the immediate impulsive reaction to say, like, no, we need to come together in civility and we need to come together in unity, I reject that. I reject that wholeheartedly because for too long we've had at different levels of government people calling for civility and unity over what's necessary which is accountability and justice. Yeah and, and, and just to sort of reframe this I think the question is a good one but I think oftentimes when we ask what can people do or how can you know public officials be held accountable it places the onus on the people. I think what, what that misses is the people have been speaking. Yeah, the problem is they're not being heard. Yeah. You know, you go to the South End, we, we spoke to you know, folks there, they've been asking for things, like Ali said, for decades, yeah. for decades. And, and they're very simple things, things that, you know, if, if somebody with a, a certain, um, a, a home of a certain square footage in West Dearborn asked for, it would be done overnight. Um, so that's very much a glaring disparity. And I think like, um, it, it's really, in Dearborn's case, it's the public officials that need to do more listening. Yeah. yeah. It's very abusive. You mm. can't like catch people in a moment like this where they're very rightfully so speaking out on something that shouldn't have happened and then tell them that it's their fault that we don't have yeah. unity. And that's always the reaction that I see is like, you're getting slapped on the wrist for speaking up about your abuse. That you're trying to tell someone who has the power to yes. lift that off of you to take away and all they have to say to you is that you're rocking the boat and you need to like chill out because we're one city, one community. And it's like, well, we weren't one city, one community when my when there was shit in my basement, like literally. Yeah, no, the, the, the idea of unity is really used as, as a cudgel to hit people over the head with. Um, because, you know, unity is convenient, um, but it doesn't reflect the reality of how people are living. Yeah. We're not living in unison. We're living with deep, cavernous divides um, that even though the city doesn't formally recognize East and Southeast and West, people's household incomes recognize that, people's health yeah. outcomes reflect that, uh, you know, how people cope with disasters, you know, as, as Ali said, it truly is the iron law of natural disasters, which is low income people and, and other vulnerable populations will always be hit the hardest. Yeah. And we saw that in full view. It was wild because I learned from your article that Dearborn has the third highest poverty rate in the, in the entire state, which is crazy. Yeah. We don't talk about it. We, no, we don't talk about it. And then, like, the fact that we're considered white still in the census. And, like, it, there's so many, like, so much nuance to that conversation. But it's just, people don't talk about it. And even just, like, the stark difference between, what, 72,000 in the west side and, like, 32 on... Um, 72,000 what? Um, was the median income oh, 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 yeah. for the west side versus 32,000. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I want to talk a little bit about the South End. I know we brought it up a few times. I actually was humbled in my DMs about this because I was posting a lot and I uh, had a really good friend reach out to me and say, like, we've been like kind of checking me, like, listen, girl, like, we've been saying this forever on the <laughs> South End. You guys are just like starting to get on board because it affected you. I know, like, my basement has been flooded a few times, but she was right. Like, I didn't. I really didn't realize this was a political issue, an inequity, until this time around, you know, much to the credit of you guys educating people, but she really checked people on the fact that, like, they have been talking about this, and I wonder, like, what is it that, that like, what is it that's going to get us to listen to each other? I, I say this for the east side, to the south, to the west, and why is it that every time we're talking about the real differences that exist, people feel like we're creating this rivalry, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's a great question, quite frankly. I, I wish city council and the mayor were sitting here instead of me answering that because that's what's required of them. I don't know. I, 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 I mean, you said your basement was flooded. You know, I'm, I'm sure we all had like natural disasters happening. You know, I, I remember in 2014 when our basement was flooded, my family's uh, basement was flooded. Like that, that, that chronic 
You know that chronic, like, low-grade inflammation? That people attribute with, like, a medical condition? That's what people in East Side and the, uh, East Side and the South End are experiencing now chronically. Mm -hmm. Like, every single day, as a result of the flood, because it, it, it exacerbated pre-existing structural inequities, but it's, it's, it's the condition of being uh, that says, well, this is the way I, this is, this is just my, the, the, the cards that life handed me, and therefore I got to deal with it. And, and, and no, man, like, you, you know how heartbreaking that is to hear when people that grew up on the West Side through no effort of their own, who didn't have to deal with this chronic low-grade inflammation, who didn't have to deal with the flooding, and those who did, by the way, too, because they still had the resources after, afterwards to help improve their condition, their rotten condition. And I think, I think it's on city officials to paint that picture of what a future looks like where government treats its people equitably. And equity means handing, not, not handouts, but making sure that people who are at the margins are given the resources to live a life full of dignity. Yes, and, and I also think for the purpose of this conversation, this is going to sound very counterintuitive, but I actually think we have to take the focus off of the actual flooding event. Mm -hmm. This isn't, like, the, the flood was only... The, the match that was struck, yeah. but there was a tinderbox ready for the match. And I think when we emphasize and, and really focus on the flood, um, that sort of paves the way for people to, to offer these, you know, um, you know, well, East Dearborn has different soil and, you know, East Dearborn's 12 feet lower than West Dearborn. Those things may be true, by the way. Um, when we asked city officials for this piece, who was responsible? No names were named. We got sort of uh, a, a semi-academic response mm -hmm. talking about topography and geography and, and engineering. And why do you think they do that? Well, I mean, uh, th they may, f they may uh, sincerely view this as a non-human error. Um, but I think what that misses, and again, to my point, like why it's important to not just focus on the flood, is because if you don't understand the other insults and the other injuries, if you don't, if you don't approach the flood as a window into a bigger story, mm -hmm. which is a story of inequity and injustice and misrepresentation and people not being heard, then you're going to miss everything. Mm -hmm. Because that is the story. When it comes to government, um, you know, the, the biggest resource government has is not tax revenue or money, it's trust. The moment you lose the trust, we could have 15 independent investigations that forensically identify how this flood happened. But if the people don't trust the government, it won't matter. That is definitely a very true point. So with the closing question, what are you both asking of Dearborn right now moving forward? I mean, I, I've, I've personally seen a boldness um, with people sharing their stories, um, which is still, for very complex cultural reasons, a pretty taboo thing to do. Um, because when you start talking about things like class and, 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 and ethnicity and, and colorism, which you, you all have talked about really eloquently, um, these things are taboo to talk about. What I'm seeing is an awakening of people putting their stories out there and, and, and forcing people to grapple uh, with them. So. I, I want to see more of that from Dearborn, for sure. You know, the, the great philosopher Marcus Aurelius once said, uh, yeah, if, it, if it is not true, do not say it. If it is not right, do not do it. And, and we really wanted to do that with this piece. And how people grapple with, that's, that's their cross to carry, not ours. And if so, if someone read this piece and felt a tinge of insecurity, a tinge of projection, uh, I, I hope you grapple with that. I, I hope you suffer with that a little bit too, because suffering is learning. And if you're at, the, at a particular part of the ladder where you're benefiting Fitting, then I think it's incumbent upon you on this short time that we have here to make sure that we're doing what's necessary to assure the conditions that everyone gets to live a life of dignity and a life of health and guess what a life of joy because everyone's entitled to joy and so you know that's that's up to the readers for, of this piece and quite frankly it's up to the residents of Dearborn to ask themselves how do you feel right now and I, how, why do you feel that way and I hope you struggle with that because that's what we wanted to do with this piece love that. Thank you both. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your work in representing the stories and, and bringing that truth to light.